welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for being here. We're um, on episode five, I think, of this uh, blockchain blockchain blog, and now we're working on interviewing one of our advisors here at Decor, and this is Jason Butcher from Coin Payments. So, Jason, for those that might not know who you are and what Coin Payments does, although it's pretty much in the name, okay, what can you tell us about the company? Yeah, sure. We started the business originally in 2013. Uh, we started the business to provide uh, easy and useful platforms and, and systems to allow merchants to accept crypto as a form of payment. So today we've got clients around the world um, in about 180 countries. We're processing well over $100 million a month in cryptocurrency transactions and supporting merchants to accept crypto as a form of payment easily. $100 million per month, right? Yeah, that's right. Is it because most people I like me included, we don't really grasp how big the the actual cryptocurrency payments industry is and how much right. actually gets processed through it. So where, where would you say the growth of this uh, transaction volume comes from? Well, it's, it's interesting because we've been doing a lot of data and reports. And I, and if you look up uh, chain analysis, chain analysis has recently come out with a recent global transaction report, sort of where things are happening. And, and interesting, a Latin American market has a pretty significant uh, P2P based basis, but it's also one of the most interesting growth areas where there's a lot of e-com and commerce market space for the, for the crypto space. But you also see the Latin American market has a lot of transactions in the in the stablecoin space. But you look at Africa, for example, it's the the transactions are very very small, but it's actually the world's largest cryptocurrency transaction market. For and mostly it's not in crypt in Africa that the trade. It's actually the trade international trade that's doing payments to uh, to Africa and or from Africa out, uh, mostly to do with just challenges, banking challenges that are in those markets. So if you look at international markets where there's challenging from banking or transactions or international transfers, I think that's where you see a tremendous amount of uh, movement and, and growth. In our own business, I think we see in our own space where transactions are happening and have been happening in our platform since 2013, where we see a continual growth. We saw our clients that we have growing as well. And in our own self, we go, you know, a significant growth. We've seen about a 60% growth in merchant base just over the last two years. Okay. And before you, like the first interview we did, and this one actually didn't came up in video because I screwed up the recording, but uh, but it's on our blog for anyone that wants to check it, was with Nick Jones from SumoPay. And SumoPay yeah. is just a getting off the ground when it comes to crypto payments. So it's good to have both visions, the, the vision of someone that's starting in there and a company that's fully set up like, like yeah. yours. And you touched up a lot of very interesting points, but one of the ones I'm personally very interested in is this stable coin market. Because as we all know, uh, there is a reticence for obvious volatility reasons for people to jump into accepting crypto payments because they feel like they're by the time it hits their wallets, it could be 20% down. And right. it, it's not that much the case lately, but it's sort of the fame that has been created around it. So how have you seen this stablecoin payment market developing? Well, we've, we've seen a significant growth in it for sure. And, and my own space, my own history background isn't uh, specifically crypto. It's really in uh, in all types of forms of payments. So I, I'm payment agnostic in certain ways. I support crypto as a form of payment for sure. But I believe that the stable cryptocurrency market will eventually be the the go-to for cross-border payments, especially. Um, and I think a lot of the individual um, payments that will happen internally in, in local markets within certain areas will see a significant growth in stable currencies as well. And in the digital cryptocurrency space anyways, um, I mean, 80% of our business or 75% of our business, probably um, you'll see transactions in mostly Bitcoin, but you, we've seen a significant increase from that used to be 95% even just a year ago to a big push towards the, the stable coin um, crypto. 
So I think the the overall growth we'll see as a, as a trend will be more transactions will happen, especially in cross border trade will happen in stable coins. How do you see this competition developing also between stable coins? Because all of a sudden, I mean, back in the day when they started doing stable coins, it was pretty much just one and that was it if you wanted to do something stable. But now there right. seems to be so many of them. So how do you, from your impartial point of view, how has that developed? I guess from a from a global payment space, if you if you're in Argentina, say for example, you want to deal with local currency, but do you want to deal with local currency? I, I look at it as this: is I'm from Canada originally, and okay. in Canada, I can spend my Canadian dollars in Canada one to one all the time, no matter what the value of that Canadian dollar is, and of course, price of bread and products and things fluctuate. But I'm still spending a dollar. I can't actually take my Canadian dollar anywhere. And spend it. Nobody will accept my Canadian dollar. I can't go to the U.S. and accept and spend it. I can't go to the U.K. and spend it. So if I'm spending my currency within my local jurisdiction or local markets, I believe that those local currencies will be the ultimate digital currency or cryptocurrency that will be used. So if it's a stable currency that is uh, a U.S. dollar, for example, and you're doing a U.S. trade or U.S. transaction then most likely you'll want to use a, a stable coin in that currency. But in the European market, if you're doing a European transaction, you may ch choose to or prefer to use a stable currency within the European market. Um, and, and I think that's ultimately why you're going to see more and more uh, additional uh, stable coins. Of course, in the US, you've got you know a few different ones that are all trying to compete all for the same US market space. And, I, I think that's just about adoption. It's you could relate it to what's the difference between Visa card and a MasterCard, right? Well, Visa has probably more users at some point than MasterCard did, but there's more adoption and more use. Now there's not really any difference between a Visa card and a MasterCard, but you could relate similar similar types of uh, scenarios within that. It's just adoption and, and usage. And um, speaking of adoption, you mentioned that you're in 182 countries, right? That's right, yeah. 182 countries, 2.2 million users, and over 100 million per month moving around. So how, and you've been pretty early for those that might not know, you've been here since 2013. So yeah. how does the role look to get so big? And it's, well, it's a considerable amount of time. I, don't, I imagine it was not just like skyrocketing all of a sudden, but it's, Seems like an interesting hostel. You know, a little a little background. So, in 2013, the the founders uh, and and really the founder Alex, uh, who started the business, he he was actually selling products and services to the crypto mining industry. So he wanted to accept altcoins as a form of payment. So that's really how the business was started. It was it came from a need, and it came to solve solve the problem that he was having, which was having a stable platform to accept uh, the altcoins as a form of payment. And sh very soon after they, the, the group started the business originally, uh, they went from a couple hundred clients to a thousand clients to 2000 clients. And in 2015, 2016, when, when I was introduced to the business, I was helping Alex look at the business overall and how to strategize it. And the opportunity re really represented itself to say, hey, this is actually going to be something that we're going to grow into and, and adoption is going to take time for sure. But the opportunity was significant enough for us to really start moving the business to focus on on really merchants and, and solving their issues with, with also adding crypto as a form of payment. So in 2015, we saw a significant increase from a couple thousand clients to almost 50,000 clients. And from 2016, 2017, we started seeing a lot of growth. Of course, everybody saw the growth of the ICO market, more adoption, more knowledge, more industry sort of space. And we saw uh, a significant increase in our users from 50,000 to 150,000 to 800,000. And when we kind of hit the million mark as to the amount of wallets that we had issued, we really said, you know, this is something that's going to take, again, it's still going to take some time for true adoption. Um, but we definitely had a tremendous growth. And and then from a revenue standpoint, with the growth, we also saw our merchants growing. So from 2017, 
our number has definitely increased our 2018 and 2019 and 2020 we've just continually see that, seen a significant increase in not just our users, but also our, our revenues because our users are also growing in the amount of transactions that they're having. So it's it's been a, it's been a great long road for sure. A lots of adoption, lots of challenges with making sure that we were compliant in all our areas. We had to figure out how to do KYC and AML and transaction monitoring and ensure that we were compliant in all the areas that we work in. And it's definitely no uh, no easy feat, but it's been a, a, a long a long and great road. And thankfully to all of our continued users and loyal uh, customers, it's it's great to be able to continue and provide new innovative services. How has the because you mentioned this KYC AML avoiding all these negative things that come and indirectly more and more. It, it seems to get left behind in the past, but back in the day, crypto was pretty much related in everyone's minds to these types of transactions, right? So can you tell us a bit more of how it was back in the early days to, to deal with that side? Yeah, well, I, I guess in, in early days, you had early adopters, right? And the early adopters were really the crypto uh, community, the blockchain community, which were focused on new innovation or distribution that was um, distributed sort of networks, which didn't have any main sort of governance or control, et cetera. And you still see those and hear those those words come up um, still today. But I think what, what I witnessed myself is when I requested and required our company to really move towards our compliance standpoint, um, we had some pushback from our own team, you know, that are really blockchain developers and crypto guys who were in the industry since the early, you know, 2010, 2011. And they, there was hesitation about would we lose clientele? Would the market uh, not accept having to do KYC and AML? And to be honest, back in the day when we were running, the business was just running and letting everybody do the transactions as they wanted to do it. We weren't really keeping track of our data. We weren't really keeping track of of transactions and there wasn't really systems available to do that. So as new systems came about, like the systems that we use internally and, and our third party providers and partners and strategic groups, they help us ensure that those things are in order. We haven't lost clients. We continually grow and the clients that we have and, and are attracting are groups that appreciate, understand and know that they too also have to follow KYC, source of funds, financial services act, those types of things. So rather than a decrease in business, we saw an increase in business, which is which has been very powerful for us. And it's very positive, particularly when you know that we've been through good times and bad times, and that sort of tends to shake people away. And as they say, people get cold hands, right? Absolutely. Um, and there, are, there are still groups that are out there, you know, that are really pushing the decentralized elements. And you see the, De the whole DeFi group and certain elements of the, that mindset is saying, hey, we're really decentralized, but um, you still have to figure out the compliance standpoint, even if you are decentralized or a lot of the P2P networks and systems that are allowing people to do those things between each other, which works really, really well for certain types of um, spaces and certain types of industries and markets. But when there's regulations that come in place and they say this is what needs to happen between a person and a person if they're transacting value or money or anything else there still needs to be reporting so those systems have been continuous in almost every market around the world and you know we do our our best to stay in uh, follow best practices and ensure that we work with uh, regulations and and compliance as we can do you think it's possible that <laughs> It never gets to the point where decentralization goes over regulations head like we because you see this with every emerging technology, as you said, right, you yeah. you first have a phase where obviously no one knows what's going on in the regulation space and there are no tools to or even incentives to regulate and then it sort of catches up slowly slowly so do you ever see like it could be completely it could go too fast for regulators to act on this space 
Well, I mean, innovation is innovation, right? Things things happen on a continuous basis. Regulators tend to take a long, long time to actually get in place, um, to actually spe make specific laws and regulations. The, the misunderstanding, I think, in certain ways, though, is that there's so many of those regulations that are com they come out and they create new specific regulation to say cryptocurrency or today you have uh, FATF with uh, virtual asset service providers regulations and they have sort of a guidance. But that guidance is actually the same guidance that they have with uh, money laundering laws and regulations that are currently out there or securities rules and regulations that are out there. And you can probably see by looking at, say, U.S. securities or SEC filings and stuff like that recently or over the last year, all those laws were still there, <laughs> even though people may have been abusing them or taking advantage that there wasn't a regulation, but there was a regulation. And that's why some people are are having to deal with those systems and situations now by paying fines or dealing with circumstances. Because if you really look at the payments industry, those regulations are already there pretty much anywhere in the world. So if you're exchanging value and say you're a barter and in Canada, as an example, I'll give you an example. In Canada, crypto is actually looked at as a commodity. So if you're bartering or trading a commodity, which is a which is an asset of some form, it's taxable. It has to be uh, KYC, AML it has to be reported. It's been around since you know, ages. The, the law and the regulations came out and and it's pretty straightforward and simple. And in the U.S., it's a different regulation, which falls under securities laws, brokerage laws, and financial financial laws or money services business laws. In Europe and the U.K., it's different. And, and so, if you follow this, the best practices globally, you'll you'll pretty much find a, a regulation or law that will fit within your within your market. And that, that's a very interesting point because, uh, well, I personally have never considered that, as you say. The U.S. considers crypto one way, Europe considers it another way, Canada, etc. So, how, how do you <laughs> does that make a mess in your company? How, how do you deal with? Absolutely. I mean, we we have a fairly significant infrastructure that allows us to operate in different markets, um, and the, it is it is messy sometimes because uh, you have to pay attention to new regulations that come out and follow those regulations and different things happen in different times, which means it gives us time to plan around that. So in Canada, we recently got a, an MSB registration as an example, because it's required to, to be registered as an MSB or a money service business in the Canadian market. And in the US, we're working through third parties and partnerships to ensure that we're regulated and stay healthy. And in the European market, we have uh, an Estonian operation, which supports our our uh, uh, custodial wallet platform that we operate. And in the UK, we're now working through getting licensed and operated in there. So, you know, it's a continuous um, challenge, um, but it's it's good work. And if it was easy, I think, um, you know, probably wouldn't be worth doing it. So I think it's I think it's it's definitely worth worth the business and worth all the effort. and. And hopefully all the merchants and the groups that we, we provide services to benefit from it. How long would you say it takes to when a new regulation hits and it, if it's a big one, how, how long do you, would you say it takes to make the all the processment process to adapt to that? Well, in the U.S. at the moment, the, what we're working through is a process which will probably take 18, 18 months to actually uh, be in a position that will be fully compliant. And can you can you kind of exist in a? I'm not trying to compromise you here. <laughs> Are right. you, can you kind of exist in a gray area in the me in the meantime, or how does that there's, look like? Yeah, there's there's not really gray areas. There's just areas that we operate either through through partnerships or providers and service providers that can okay. offer those services. Um, and in different and in different areas, maybe the 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 amount of transactions or business that we're doing is very, very small. So in certain areas, maybe we won't necessarily decide to do com full compliance. Um, but because we're registered and licensed in certain jurisdictions, we still fall into a position where the clients are really focused on marketing to us or coming to us. So we don't necessarily market in the jurisdictions that we, that we feel challenged by regulation. Okay. And since, well, you have so many 
customers and they're all around the world. So you, you must notice some very interesting trends in there, right? Um, which industries would you say have been the first or the fastest to adopt this and which are catching up for whatever reason? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, of course, we don't just see an industry trend or an adoption trend. We also see, of course, this this year we're dealing with COVID, right? So um, we could say, you know, it's COVID that drove all this new business. But looking through my, my recent review of our own financials and our own business stats for the last year, we've been in a pretty consistent uh, year over year path from last year to this year. So I think that it's the overall adoption. Um, it's the industry, the global markets that are promoting crypto, the, the fact that there's regulations that are allowing for new uh, new companies that had never accepted crypto before to actually adopt to this crypto. So the the interesting industries that we see is, is definitely uh, groups like the travel industry, which never really accepted uh, crypto um, even a year and a half ago or a year ago, there was a couple. They want any business they can get right now. Well, they, and, and the thing is, is that most of those groups, they needed to be able to have access to the funds, right? So if you accepted crypto a year and a half ago, there was many more challenges with actually converting or settling, getting settlement in a fiat currency to say, pay for the airlines and the airline industry is a very, it's an interesting area because you have. You have to the, the people that are selling those tickets need to be able to pay for those tickets right away as soon as they're they're booked. So in a crypto space a year and a half ago, you didn't have the ability to instantly convert the crypto to fiat. And today there's suppliers everywhere around the world that are able to provide that service. So regulations within the banking industry, support and understanding and, and review of the compliance standpoint with um, you know, compliance systems even two years ago really weren't at the state that they are today. So whether it was KYC or transaction monitoring groups like blockchain intelligence group or chain analysis or Cypher or different groups like that, that were that have, have all this data that can, is now available today that wasn't available a couple years ago, large, large organizations that have huge um, situations that are financial situations, they have got reputational risk, those clients a couple of years ago or groups a couple of years ago weren't really uh, accepting to crypto. And so today you have many more investment funds. You have groups like the JP Morgans, for example, and the, the large financial industry markets that are supporting crypto. So as that's happened, we're seeing lots of new growth in different industries like the travel industry that have had rapid growth and expansion. Of course, COVID has maybe shut down certain parts of the travel space too, or limited the amount of travel. But there's other groups like trading and FX and and just general e-commerce, um, more and more e-commerce platforms like Shopify and other groups that are really supporting payments as a whole um, and supporting crypto is is very interesting. Are, is, is that something? Well, you touched very briefly on this, but but I'm very interested. Is that something that you eventually aim to do as well to provide this liquidity? from crypto to fiat currencies? Yeah, we, um, we're we actually working on it right now with the, the challenges we have, of course, is we're in so many different markets, um, but we are in the process and about to launch uh, fiat settlements into the US, into Canada, into the UK, into Europe. And through other strategic partnership conversations, we're looking at also adding in the Latin American market as well as uh, the Asian market. So we, we do it through licensed regulated bodies that are allowed to and, and have the infrastructure to be able to distribute those funds either through local payment settlement systems or through wires. And um, it just hit me that some people might not fully understand this part because um, I didn't, <laughs> to be fully honest, I didn't until I was researching the company and you for this interview. Okay. Uh, why is it that a company, let's say, this is a very good example, um, airline, why does an airline need to have coin payments in the middle when they could, uh, I mean, in the in the mind of someone, they could just post their, let's say, Ethereum address on their, on their website? Sure. Well, there's definitely a number of elements to that. One is that if they post their public address on the on their website, ad website, they're going to basically announce that that's their public address and and make it fully open to anybody potentially 
hackers or potentially other organizations and groups. Um, so for, for us, for example, we create an easy method and system that's not uh, not using this exact same wallet in, wallet um, that's specifically theirs. So there's a lot of technical in, integrations. We also do automatic con, uh, verifications and a number of different things that from a technical standpoint, a lot of merchants just don't have the ability to have those systems. We also run all of our own nodes for every single blockchain and, and coin that requires a, a node to be run. So there's a lot of infrastructure that we supply to a, a merchant or to a user that, that would be not necessarily suitable for a merchant to, to run themselves. And what's, um, what, what are the benefits of running these nodes? Uh, for us, it allows for the instant sort of settlements. It allows for us to do the verification systems and and gives us the ability to actually have direct access into that into that chain. And when you were talking about this um, providing liquidity, well, what else goes into into making that a reality? Well, there, there's a couple of things. So liquidity, as far as what we're talking about, is really what I would consider a settlement. So a settlement, just as say would say a merchant would accept Visa or Mastercard, the settlement is funds in their bank account. So uh, access to accept crypto as a form of payment, which maybe they accept that Bitcoin, and then they want to convert that Bitcoin into their local fiat, and that's the settlement process. So. In the middle of that, there is a liquidity process because the the crypto needs to be converted into uh, into a fiat, and then we need to settle that fiat into their local bank account. So that's the that's the full process. So in the systems that are required, there is financial instruments that are required. There is liquidity providers such as exchanges or OTC desks or partners that convert that crypto into fiat. And then we need to have the financial facility in, in the midst to be able to settle that to the merchant's local bank account. And this sounds like, a, I mean, your company and your case sounds like a perfect example where they, there would be the possibility to integrate decentralized finance in a, in a creative way, right? Because all of a sudden these new tools, they allow companies and the systems itself themselves to run things automatically that they would have never been able to do in the regular world as to speak so yeah. what are your what are your views on that what are your plans for for decentralized finance well i mean if if there is an opportunity or the the right group that made sense to us to partner with or create a strategic partnership with that that could provide that type of solution um it would be it'd be really interesting for us to to look at and consider we ourselves um, try to stay within the confinement of the regulations. And um, I think if the, the appropriate DeFi kind of organizations stay within those regulations as well, we would see some really great growth together um, by providing unique and innovative payment solutions. Okay, uh, I'm looking at the clock and I think it's um, this is a good point to start wrapping up because I, I know yeah. you're a busy guy. Um, how would you, just to start wrapping up, how would you say, because you look in the crypto payment space and it's so big and it's so full of competitors and it's a, it's a tough space and you're dealing with very big guys and there are more of them coming. So how, how do you say you've managed to push them up, to, to push them away and stay on your, on your lane of achieving this yearly, yearly growth? Sure. I guess the, the biggest point from my own, my own personal opinion is that we, we try not to focus on um, other groups or what they're doing or say competitors. Um, I think there's always room in every market around the world that allow for multiple groups to provide similar types of services. So we focus on what we do. We focus on uh, trying to provide the best service to our customers and try to provide the best solution and the best service. So definitely our, our rates are, are one of the most competitive, which helps us in the competitive standpoint. Um, but there's other areas and that's a part of our own personal growth, which is to focus on strategic partnerships with the likes of new payment processors or large payment processors that have great relationships with merchants, allowing us to bring our technology into their, their infrastructure. So there's a, there's a number of ways for us to really just stay focused on our own, our own business model and continue providing the best possible service to our clients. And as a final question. Decor, 
Um, where do you, how do you see decor evolving over time? And yeah, like what, what, what's your vision for decor? Well, you you don't mean, have to be nice just because I'm here. <laughs> Pretend well, you're talking to someone else. Yeah, there's definitely a few pieces to that. You know, I, I think from a from a standpoint of first of all providing services with uh, with Simon, I think there's some really really interesting opportunities for it to to really help other organizations uh, grow by by learning lessons and getting really good insights. And uh, in my former life, I've had incubators and accelerators, and I was an entrepreneur coach and helped with a lot of entrepreneurial projects. And I think if Decor is to really move, like as it moves forward to focus on really providing that that new resource and help and assistance with both entrepreneurial groups, but also businesses and, and individuals, but also, you know, people that are supporting these other groups grow, they're, they're gonna have tremendous um, adoption as well. And I, I really excited to be a part of the group. Because, I feel like the crypto space has gotten the idea of stuff needs to be transparent, right? Like that's a, th that's the main value behind everything. But at the same time, you know, most people don't want to be fully transparent in every single aspect of their lives, right? Like <laughs> that's yeah. something that's a bit scary. So trying to do the research for companies and trying to do institutional grade research for and make it widely available. I think it's a, it's a very worthy mission. Uh, what, since we have you here and uh, you're the first people that actually collaborates with Decor that we get to interview, uh, sure. what what did you see in the in the road to make this vision possible in order to get transparency to be more widely available? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank. I guess the, the the main purpose and reason and, and reason I got involved is is the leadership, right? So I, whenever I look at the entities or people that I've helped or worked with, it's it's the it's the leadership or the team that are involved in the projects, and I and really that's where I'm involved with with it for. So there is definitely the elements of of transparency and the research and all of the other elements that I know that I'll benefit from myself. As well as other people that I'll refer the I refer the business to, but from a from a standpoint of why I'm involved, it's really from the leadership and the team that, that Simon's put together, and I'm excited by by what everybody can bring to the table and and how their focus is to help the industry grow. And that is it. If you're running a shady team, we'll get you. <laughs> we'll find <laughs> out. <laughs> Jason, thank you very much for doing this, man, and very nice to to get to talk to you. Absolutely. Thanks, Carlos. Take anything, care. anything else you'd like to to say to our viewers before we cut the the video? No, I, I think I think it's excellent. If anybody's interested or keen to accept crypto as a form of payment, you can always check out uh, coinpayments.net and feel free to uh, reach out anytime you need extra support. Definitely do. I know. Thank you again, and we'll see you guys next week for our next video.